Okay, that sounds good. Right, well, Tom, welcome. Um, thanks very much for joining us. Um, uh, uh, perhaps just to start off, I mean, I've explained a little bit about who you are, but perhaps it, it would be great if you could just, you know, um, tell, tell us a bit about, you know, your various writings and teachings and stuff. Yeah, sure. So um, my sort of job title these days is um, quite long winded and I kind of regret choosing it because um, it doesn't fit onto things like business cards very easily. But I'm an associate professor of creative writing and global journalism, um, and it, which sounds broad and it kind of is quite broad, but it does sort of strangely seem to summarise what I kind of teach and what I research and what I write. Um, because I think a bit like you, Tom, I mean, I, I'm, I'm quite pluralistic in my interests as a reader and a writer. You know, I do a lot of um, journalism, sort of short form kind of journalism. And um, I've written four books now, which uh, in different forms and genres, I've written a sort of academic book um, <clears throat> of kind of literary and media analysis and I've written two kind of travel narratives. I've written a kind of travel, a kind of commercial travel guide book. Um, I've um, I've just had a novel accepted by a small publisher here in the UK. Um, so I'm kind of a bit all over the place in terms of the platforms I write for and the, the genres I work in. But I suppose there are certain common themes and common pre sort of preoccupations and um you know, and pl places that I've focused on as a travel writer and as a as a sort of um, literary critic. So the Philippines has been an abiding interest of mine for sort of more than 20 years, I suppose. Um, and that came out of um, living in Manila for a brief period um, in the sort of late noughties, early 2010s. And also just having become sort of interested in the history of that part of the world as a young, you know, as a sort of young person, as a student and, um, and so on. Uh, yeah. And then I suppose certain themes that I keep, I'm quite interested in sort of outsiders and marginal figures. They seem to figure um, consciously and subconsciously in, in a lot of my writing. And I'm interested in sort of power and ideology and politics, and that manifests itself in various in these various um kind of sorts of writings that I do um so so yeah I, I think well, um I, I don't know why I have this kind of wide maybe too wide interest but I, I do remember reading something um by um people will be aware of Neil Gaiman the British sort of fantasy writer and comic book script writer um and I remember him saying making this comment about um not he, he wanted to feel like he wasn't doing the same kind of thing over and over again with each new book or story that he was writing and he felt without naming names um he felt that other writers certain other writers do sort of do the same thing over and over again maybe because of commercial um pressures they find a formula that works and makes them some money so the publishers tells them, well, just kind of do the same thing next time and we'll all be happy. We'll make money. You'll make money. So it could just be quite for quite quite banal reasons like that. Or um, I don't know for whatever reasons, but I've always been really scared of doing that. I feel like you only live once and I wouldn't. And, you know, how many books are you going to write in your life or how many articles are you going to write in your life? And the idea that I might have repeated myself, I probably have, to be honest. <laughs> Everybody does to an extent. But, you know, I've just tried to yeah just tried to avoid repeating myself i suppose and if that means working in a different form or a different genre for the next project then then so be it i don't know yeah i think that's interesting isn't it i mean i that, you know this idea of um repetition and so on and i think it's probably true that people are under quite a lot of commercial pressure um to you know write something you know i think there was some story about jk rowling wasn't there she had a bit of a problem persuading her publisher that he didn't just have to write harry potter but, you know. yeah yeah i can imagine that because it's there's so many people standing to benefit from that franchise i suppose um, yeah but then at the same time she probably 
has the power to say, I'm, you know what, I'm going to do what the hell I like now. And it, and it's a bit like, um, yeah, it's an, in, yeah, it is interesting that the, you know, the sort of choices that you get to make the privilege that you might have in that position, because, um, you, you can either, I think we can all think of certain kind of Hollywood actors that just seem to do the same old sort of generic rubbish because they get paid a lot of money and in a way who can blame them but it doesn't whether they feel very artistically fulfilled I don't know but um but then there but then there are interesting figures like um you know like John Sayles the American film director who um writes these commercial scripts for Hollywood gets paid a massive amount of money for them and then plows that money into these art films you know that he directs mm. people might be aware of films like Mate one and um uh what was the sort of recent one that he did he did a very good one about the philippine american war actually i can't remember the name of it but it was but you know these are very these are very low budget people you know the, the the actors work for the um the union minimum wage and everything um but yeah he's able to you know buy his freedom to do that kind of more for him more satisfying work by being this kind of yeah a, a kind of very reliable sort of holly commercial hollywood scriptwriter you know and mm -hmm. I, I dare say that there are um you know novelists that you know might try i suppose if you tried something that wasn't commercial and it didn't do very well then you might be it might be you know you might be put off taking a risk again i don't know or your publisher might not be very happy about it but i'm not yeah Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, you said, you know, you're, you're very sort of pluralistic and writing in different ways. I mean, uh, one of the one of the the sort of interesting things I always have with things like travel writing, um, as well as the the stuff about writing about place, is this sort of paradox that you sort of need to have a story, but real life. <laughs> doesn't necessarily provide you with a, a ready-made sort of narrative structure. I wondered if you had any thoughts about, you know, that kind of... Yeah, that's, kind of... A, really, that's a big one, I think, Tom, you know, and, you know, it, it's, um, you know, something that has, uh, you, you know, I, I, I've sort of investigated quite a bit and tried to sort of learn, you know, learn from other writers about because it is... Um, you know, it's a challenge whenever you, you know, you go out into the world and you have an experience, you travel somewhere. And, um, you know, you've you've gathered all this data, as it were, through your experiences and through um, what you can glean secondhand, as it were, from reading. And, you know, and I think what I like about travel writing is that it is a, something of a hybrid form in that way, you know, it involves different forms of gathering knowledge and you know, and, and, and information. Um, but yeah, how do you present that? In a way? Especially if you, if what happened to you was actually quite boring and unpromising and there wasn't a lot of drama and there wasn't a natural, as you say, kind of story arc running through it. I mean, I, I suppose I've just, I've just learned from others. I remember, um, read, you know, Colin Thubron, the, the sort of British travel writer of the quite major figure in sort of late 20th century um, well he's still he's still he's still writing now but I think he made his name in the sort of 70s and 80s and he had some useful tips so he talks about how you know you, you can sort of exercise some artistic or literary license um and um you know if if in real life your trip to wherever the 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 sort of most interesting thing happened in the fir on the first day and then the other 10 days were deadly boring then you can sort of when you come to write that up and try to give it a sort of narrative structure as you you know as you put it you can move that what would be naturally a kind of climax or a finale you can you can make that happen on the ninth or tenth day rather than on the first day, and so that there are sort of simple things you can do like that. Um, I suppose there's a point, that, you know, that another big um, potential controversy here is sort of how much of that playing around can you do before it becomes fiction? And my 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 sort of view of that is I don't really care because of the 
pluralistic outlook that I have. And I, I sort of don't mind that, you know, like Bruce Chatwin, you know, not the sort of the same generation, you know, he, he said like, you know, I thought, I, I thought I delivered a novel to my publisher, but they quickly told me, no, this is a travel book. And therefore there's some, it has to bear some relation to reality um, because I don't know, probably just for marketing reasons, but he never made any, um, you know, he, 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 you know, he never made any pretense about just kind of embellishing and making stuff up and changing around quite radically what really happened to him in order to turn it into a good story. Um, I think he got into an argument with Paul Theroux, again, another member of that generation, who said, no, 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 that's cheating. That's kind of cheating. You've got to, you know, the, the challenge for the travel writer is to sort of try and make what really happened work as a story without mucking around with it too much and without tinkering or too much invention. I, I happen to think both approaches are fine, but but I think maybe where people get into trouble is when they, um, you know, uh, where they're not upfront about that, you know, and you see this in certain forms of memoir where people make a sort of pact with the reader or with the public, which is sort of, you know, to the you know this is all true this all happened to me and then they get found out that they've broken that that sort of contract or that pact they get some someone says well no i that didn't happen like that at all and or they're making stuff up that's where you get unstuck whereas i think someone like chatwin was always up front about you know how much he would embellish and invent and play around and things so yeah it's a really it's a hugely interesting topic i think and it's you know that uh, i dare say the sort of argument will will go on and on and on for as long as we have travel writing and literature and, and so, yeah 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 i mean I, I suppose it's also become uh particularly relevant with this the rise of sort of you know well, what we now have to call auto fiction um and you know where does that that probably touches on what you were mentioning about memoir and making some kind of contract and um, yeah there's another there's a um there was a book came out 10 or 12 years ago called reality hunger by david shields and he's um it's quite impressive this guy is a i think he, he he's a professor at one of the the, the sort of prestigious american colleges <laughs> not only does he claim that there's fundamentally no real difference between fiction and non-fiction but he also argues that i think i'm right in saying he argues that plagiarism it should not really be you know like we're, we're in this age of where you can't we can't really enforce anti-plagiarism because of ai and because everything in his view is a sort of um and i think he got he th there's lots of quotes in the book and i think he argued quite hard with his publisher not to so not to cite them properly not to have footnotes or have a kind of bibliography because but his publisher was like, no way, we're not going to risk <laughs> that kind of legal action. But I think it's quite amusing that someone, you know, a college professor of that sort of stature is sort of arguing this for this quite quite radical and unorthodox sort of approach to writing. But, you know, he talks about how all these sort of, um, all, all these sort of um, texts that are held up as being, um, you know, classics of, of memoir and nonfiction and, and basically have supposedly having a real kind of, truth status to them mm. like um you know orwell's uh such such were the joys you know his kind of memoir of, of being a, 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 a eaten school and the horrible time he had as a schoolboy in this very kind of authoritarian and bullying sorts of situation you know apparent you know shield says that apparently his, orwell's contemporaries when they read that they said this is just nonsense none of this happened what was he going on about like it wasn't like that at all and then he talks about classical sort of Roman historians who were, you know, accounts of great battles and stuff, which, you know, for maybe thousands of years or hundreds of years were taken as like, this is a a very believable historical record of what happened. They've since been challenged and, you know, turned out that they, you know, it was all kind of pieced together from hearsay and rumours and, you know, and so forth. So it can make you a bit paranoid about what you can, what you can actually believe or not if you're, if you're depending on, as I say, the sort of, yeah, the truth, you know, that the, 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 these texts are supposed to reflect some kind of truth. So, you know, don't, 
don't you know be skeptical i think you know at all times and don't don't disappoint yourself i suppose is the, maybe the moral of that story i and i guess you know as, as writers i think well, you mentioned it briefly there you know like being up front about it i think is an important yeah element. you know whenever i try and write non-fiction write travel writing you know the stuff you, of mine you've seen it i always try and make sure it's pretty obvious that this is just my point of view and this is also just a specific time you know mm -hmm. um just because i you know what i saw in albania in 2006 doesn't mean that albania in 2024 is going to be the well i know it but you know it yeah that kind of idea yeah um, and is that something that you 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 have done with a kind of disclaimer or at the beginning or something that you would try to make almost part of the story or part of the narrative, this self-awareness or self-consciousness of the, I don't know, sort of unreliability of your own take or, or on this or? Yeah, I was like, well, yeah, that's interesting. I think, I think it, yeah, it's not been a disclaimer. It's all, it has been in the way I've actually written it. Mm. So, not so. I mean, the trouble is, you can get into a kind of clunky sort of. Here's a paragraph about something, and then you go, "Well, of course, <laughs> you could yes. say blah blah blah." So, I guess it was more trying. It's more been about trying to get this idea that these are sort of immediate. I don't know, sensory impressions or whatever, or my particular mm. understanding of an event, mm. but. Um, without as i say without making it too much of this um yeah too formal in that sort of explanatory way but just yeah. to yeah. i think it's annoying to read doesn't it when someone is constantly hedging in that way of like you know describing some impressive scene or person that's encountered and then you know then, then the next sort of you say the next paragraph is like um, or, or maybe maybe I've totally misremembered that and just forget everything I've just <laughs> given to yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, yeah, I know you mean it. it, it that, yeah, you know. it's a, I, I suppose it's a, also, I guess, and I don't know, this would be interesting to hear your view on it. I think even in when it's created non-fiction or and in general, you're kind of, you also have to be aware that you'll, you know, there's a narrator and that narrator is ostensibly you. Mm because you know, you're probably writing in the first person in, in that kind of narrative. Um, but also mm -hmm. just sort of realise that that's actually also a character. Yeah. Something. And and when you, yeah, exactly. And when, when you write in the first person, you, you, you're sort of, without really knowing it, you, you have created a persona, you know. And, and I think, well, it goes back to the question of like who... I don't know who I am really like can you be that consistent you know I mean I think you know I like to think that I'm sort of a reasonably intelligent person for example because I've you know I've, I've got qualifications and I'm a teacher and I write books but I've made some extremely stupid decisions in my life you know it depends what you mean by intelligence it depends what you so the idea that someone is that anyone is consistently like this or like that whether in real life or as a literary character or as a narrator is very is a very difficult thing to, to for me to sort of to, to sort of get on board with so I think when I look back at you know things I've written the first person and you know in, in that kind of creative non-fiction mold I don't know if it's the same with you I kind of look at it and think well yeah there's sort of an element of me but I'm probably exaggerating certain aspects of who I you know I'm not I don't think I you know I'm that angry about things in my normal life or I'm, or I'm that well, I, I take the piss out of things in quite the way that I, you know, as often as I do. People, people who know me might disagree. Actually, <laughs> so, so you are that annoying. Actually, you know, I don't know, but um, yeah. So it's a yeah. It's a, every, everything's a sort of a, a a kind of performance or a creation, isn't it? You, you know. Well, yeah. That's. I mean, that, um, I don't know if I told you this before, but when I was writing the um, that narrative about Albania, the one, the one that my PhD that I it was actually got really boring and I, I was reading it just thinking oh god you know it's so dull it's just like you know it's got, got lots of information but I, I sort of seem to be scared to have an opinion about anything 
Yeah. And um, actually, by sheer chance, I so I, I wrote it actually as a performance. And yes. did perform it in a theatre. And that was fascinating. That really helped. And I think maybe that's, that's why. And so performing it in front of an audience, did that put a, a, a helpful kind of pressure on you to make it more dramatic or more em emphatic, something like that? That's yeah. really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I really wrote, I didn't just perform what I'd written. I, I actually wrote it specifically as a, yeah. a, a storytelling performance. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. It yeah. was. It was just. It was different the way that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So, um, you know, it, it really taught me a lot about how you can. So then I, I kind of thought, okay, well now I can feed that into the actual. The page version. That yeah, that that's interesting. I mean, I think that does that. Maybe have some relation to um a lot of writers who who sort of say that they read aloud their draft you know I mean I do a bit of that but I but I, I think it's a bit time consuming if you're going to read every <laughs> you know sort of a 300 page book or something you're going to kind of you know read every every sentence of it but I do think it yeah you do yeah that you do sort of notice um, maybe problems with the prose or the or the tone or the language or clunky sentences that you you might not Notice if you were just looking at it. I think also there's a difference between looking at something on the screen and on paper as well. Um, and much as I try and, you know, I, I, I you know, try to help save the environment, you know, um, I, I do find myself printing, especially at the end of a project, like printing, printing up a, a whole draft of a book and going through it with a pen and just. I don't know what I don't know why I'm not I don't know what the kind of psychology is behind that or the cognitive workings are of the brain but and it might be to do with just you know my generation you know or, or you know where for the first half of my life I mean there were computers around when I was a kid but you know you didn't there was still a lot of you know I I grew up in in an analog world really you know and it was only in my early 20s when the internet became fast enough that with broadband you know that that it became so dominant in terms of you know lots of reading on screens and and now with emails and with word documents and things and pdfs it's like a load of reading has to happen on the screen but I, I don't I don't yeah I don't know whether it's because I'm a sort of an analog native rather than a digital native that I still just find it easier to take in what I read on a piece of paper even a kindle which isn't a piece of paper but they do their best to try and make it look like you know if I've got a long piece of writing to look at if it's like a sort of PhD thesis from a student or or whether it's a draft of my own work or, you know, a colleague wants me to do it, I'll, I'll try and put, at least put it on the Kindle because I just seem to, um, I don't know why, I'd say, I, I think I read more slowly. I think I'm more likely to just read too fast and thereby therefore miss things when I'm reading on a on a computer screen. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, I certainly find that too. I mean, when it comes to revising work, um, I'm not, and I, again, I don't know, you know, whether it, it is my age as well, but um, actually revising things on a piece of paper. And I think it's perhaps that, you know, when you are editing something, you need that kind of psychological distance. Yeah. You know, to be able to actually look at it more objectively. And, um, I think and also when, when it appears, yeah, I think object objectivity is is good or at least the the feeling of it because yeah when you when you transfer it from one medium to another from the screen to the page it looks it immediately looks different and, it, and immediately you can think well that I know that's still me and my work but it's sort of not it's sort of slightly not me or something or it's kind of <laughs> it's not the me that I've been you know, dealing with for so long, so many hours on this screen, you know, and therefore you can, it just helps with, you know, you re reading your work from the point of view of how a reader might resp respond to it rather than from what, from the point of view of what you're trying to achieve with it as the writer. And those are, two, I know you've talked about that 
when you came to um you know do a do a kind of talk at, at, at Portsmouth a few years ago and I found that very interesting the idea that you have to sort of almost imagine yourself into the mind of a reader that's that's come fresh to your work and how difficult that is actually because you know because you're you're so involved with with your own work as a writer for so long that it's hard to then try to be sort of objective about it but you, you have to you have to try you have to sort of train yourself don't you know train your brain to do it yeah absolutely i mean i i find that and i and, you know i think that's probably more so with i guess maybe poetry and that kind of stuff feels much more personal mm. but maybe that you know <laughs> and it and printing out doesn't involve quite so much paper that's true yeah just yeah. kind of <laughs> yeah on, on that level definitely yeah but did you feel so when you print out a poem and you're kind of revising it you're it's easier for you to sort of get into that the mindset of you know what how a reader might respond to it and whether they're going to get certain references or imagery or whatever think, yeah yeah, yeah. I, and I'm doing less so now, but um, certainly for a long time, that was the way, it, it, you know, like you, it felt like, you know, I just needed to put a, have a pile of paper and a pen to do yeah. this part of the job. You know. yeah. yeah. I mean, there are anyway, you, well, Last time yeah. we spoke, you were, you were, I think, um, you were, well, last time you very kindly spoke to my students, you were, um, you were just doing your coastal book. Mm. Um, Coast of Tea. I think you would just maybe, I don't know what stage you were at. Anyway, but that was the sort of project you were mainly involved. I just wondered if you could talk about that because that was, I mean, A, it's an unusual, well, a very interesting subject, but also because you, it was effectively a collaborative um, work. Yeah. I mean, I, I would really recommend working with, um, working collaboratively, you know, with other writers, but also, you know, with, with with that book, it was with an illustrator, you know, Louis Netta, who, um, you know, what was fun about that was that we have the same methodology, really, in terms of, you know, we were just talking about travel writing and how that, you know, um, obviously requires traveling somewhere and gathering information and impressions and ideas firsthand, you know through sort of embodied experience and and the way that Louis operates, which is quite unlike a lot of illustrators who who sort of, you know, sit sit in their studios and, and imagine things or whatever. He is a reportage illustrator. So everything that he or his drawings are drawn in situ, you know, as he calls it, sort of. So, I, I, you know, we'd be sitting, We you know, the Coast of Teeth project was a sort of a kind of tour of English seaside towns and we'd be sitting, you know, in, in a park in Blackpool or something. And I'd be taking notes about what we just encountered or seen and he'd be, he'd be drawing. So there was a, that was, that was a nice way to work with someone rather than, I suppose, an, a, a, a different kind of collaboration between um a writer and an artist might involve the writer going out and doing that and then just sending their stuff to the artist who stays at home in their studio and then just tries to interpret the you know or, or support the the words with their illustrations in some way and i think the result of yeah me and louis kind of working in that way was that there were two narrow two stories being told simultaneously through this book you know and i we've done quite a lot of talks and sort of media and things for for it and the, the, quite often interviewers will sort of assume that um you know this is my book with illustrations by louis as a sort of secondary supportive aspect and i have to say no 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 this is equal it's 50 and there is 50 50 pretty much there might even be more more illustrations than than words and that was very important because as i say there are two 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 different stories being told we thought you know we, we made a conscious decision not just not to sort of for louis to draw some object or person or whatever and me to describe that object or person or place in words you know so there's lots of drawings of things even though we traveled together and we went around together um 
we 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 didn't necessarily always record the same things and i think there's i think i think that works quite well because there's a you know there's a kind of a bit of a, a sort of an iron ironic distance sometimes between what's the story being told in images and the story being told in words or there's just you can just look at it more prosaically than that and say well you know you get more bang for your buck if you buy this book you'll get pictures of loads of interesting things and quirky things around the seaside but you'll also get some writing about other quirky things and other not all not all quirky i mean there's some we you know we went to some places that were quite um uh sort of socially deprived like like the coat southeast essex jay wick and st osseth and that sort of area which um was quite um sobering for me and louis because it it seemed like poverty that we'd only seen really in the global south you know with kind of people living in very simple accommodation with um a lot of people off the grid as it were with kind of you know not seeming to have electricity or gas piped in but using kind of gas you know kind of canisters to cook with and things um people's homes made out of sort of salvaged materials you know in the way that you know i was used I've, i was used to seeing that kind of architecture in you know like the slums of manila or india or you know but but the idea that in 2024 in britain in the supposedly developed global north there are many many people living like this and we spent a whole day walking around this these areas and we just we it went on and on and on i mean and i i dare say if we'd had another three or four days we might have seen a lot more of this kind of world that middle class british people don't know about really you know but is is obviously if you know many i don't know hundreds thousands of people live like that today and so there are these sorts of hidden or dark sides if you like to seaside towns it, you know alongside the kind of more jovial and sort of fun and quirky sort of arcade games and food that is served in these places and you know we we were i mean um you know we were, we were interested in i think you know an illustrator is necessarily interested in kind of arresting images that seem to kind of symbolize some mood or atmosphere in a place and and i am as a writer you know and i you know i'm, I'm something of a sort of psychogeographer in that way you know um or tr try to be you know and and so you know you, you start to notice these um you know something that seems at first innocuous like um i mean i, I grew up in a seaside town and i i've always been obsessed with these um with the sort of arcade machine machines the like moving cliffs i don't know whether they have them in whether they're just a uniquely british thing or whether they have them in elsewhere in europe or these sort of moving cliffs that where coins drop over the side and hopefully you keep putting coins in to push the other coins over these moving cliffs and then you hope that they'll fall into a bucket and you can you can you you, you know you've won 20p or something for your two hours of effort you know and you know there's something about you know it's like thinking about this kind of um you know the more people we met in seaside towns um that seemed kind of quite alienated and quite desperate to get out of them because there's not much there aren't many prospects in terms of jobs and in terms of you know making your way in life it seemed that a lot of the games that you end up playing in you know seem to have to, to be sort of very much based on this very narrow chance of you winning the jackpot you know and you probably won't and you probably will spend a long time putting coins in the machine but you might just you might just be that person who gets the the teddy bear or the gold watch or you know, fake gold watch or whatever so yeah we just became aware of these sorts of um you know certain objects and you know, sort of aspects of seaside towns that would seem to represent people's kinds of sort of moods and aspirations and and things so yeah do you think working with Lou with a with an illustrator do you think it changed the way you look at places at all definitely yeah and the other there was a sort of third narrative going on there as well which um I tried to 
give some sense of, which was the conversations that he and I had while we were researching. So he would, he absolutely would, you know, he might point to something with his kind of keen illustrator's eye that I, that I probably, I may not have actually noticed, you know, because I'm, I've got a different agenda. And this is where, you know, people's, Louis, an American from upstate New York, you know, um, I'm a sort of British bloke from, you know, the sort of south coast of England from a, from a kind of fading seaside town. And, you know, he's, we, and we've, so that necessarily means that, you know, you're, you're going to come into these situations with different agendas and different expectations. So uh, definitely Louis, and I made sure I quoted him when he would point something out to me, or he would, you know, like often it's to do with cultural references and the sorts of similes and the, the metaphors that you come up with, you know. Um, we, I mean, one example where there was, you know, where he, he offered me his sort of insight, and I, I hope that I offered him one back, <laughs> but they were different insights into um, this this peculiar, there's a, it, it's um, a, a sort of dance hall in the Blackpool Tower, I think, um, which is an amazing, I mean, Blackpool is full of extraordinary um, venues because it really was it was the the, the, the probably the entertainment center of of the world in the sort of late 19th century i mean oscar wilde would turn up there and you know and sort of do readings and and you had like the the leading sort of opera singers of of italy and france and you know, germany and places would come and they'd be paid a fortune and then you know frank sinatra was coming later on into the sort of 20th century and and so you have these amazing um amazing venues which they've managed to keep alive with um uh i mean what well we we just lucked out and ended up inside it ended up watching someone playing a Wurlitzer organ i don't know if people a guy in a sort of bow tie which which is a is a very curious sound and it gets quite grating after a while because there's this very high pitch sort of needling sound to it but he he was playing all these kind of traditional you know seaside songs you know english songs with people dancing sort of doing ballroom dancing but but there was a really there was a real sense of you know almost like a sort of punk thing going on where people who couldn't really dance and of all kinds of age groups young people old people People, I think, with disabilities, perhaps with, um, you know, sort of like older people with um, uh, various kinds of cognitive impairments and stuff, were just having a go at dancing and just, you know, it didn't. It, they weren't necessarily technically great dancers, and I, I don't, I can't dance myself, so I don't say this from any position of superiority. While this guy was playing on a well to organ at the end, this guy just descends under the stage you know the, the the he just sits there and the organ just goes down and then the sort of trap door closes over the top of him and me and Louis were like oh my god this is this is such a bizarre experience we've had and Louis I think likened it to a David Lynch film being American um but obviously as you know I'm a fan of David Lynch you don't have to be American and I and I I just I immediately thought of Monty Python you know that was my kind of English reference and so you know there, there are two different, and, and perhaps they're both right. You know, perhaps both those sorts of similes are correct, and and they both went into the book. So there are a lot of those sorts of um, incidents, I suppose, or, or kind of yeah observations. Yeah, yeah, because I, I mean, I've just not heard of. Well, I'm sure that I have been, but you know, mostly the books that I've read have tended to be the illustrations that come afterwards. You know, they're that yeah. kind of yeah, it's not, not quite working in, in the same sort of very collaborative way and um, yeah you know. i mean i i mean i suppose um a, a common sort of uh you know we're, we're both big fans of you know hunter s thompson and ralph steadman which you know and i i think as i understand it they they traveled together they did a lot of I mean, I don't think Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, Stedman was, if that was him and his lawyer, it wasn't Oscar Acosta, um, but certainly on a lot of their, in in Thompson's other books, and I think on, on a lot of his um, kind of ill-fated Rolling Stone magazine, um, sort of 
uh, assignments, you know, to go to the Kentucky Derby or whatever. And I think they traveled together. I, I'm, I, I, I can't remember. I don't know whether Stedman would, would do the drawings there. And then I imagine not because they're often colored in and quite carefully, whereas... Louis is really a kind of um, a black, you know, he writes in, in, you know, draws in with, you know, it's very black and white, very kind of monochrome that way. Um, so, so yeah, it was, uh, it was exciting to me because I hadn't, you know, I hadn't come across that kind of collaboration and we, we, we just get on, we've got many of this get along, you know, that, that helps. I think, you know, if you're going to collaborate with someone, um, I guess it might, I'd worked with a photographer, for for a long for a longish period on my Ivory Coast book and and I I I'd, I'd, I'd liken the methodology more to yeah a writer and a photographer or a journalist and photographer and and you know Tom I know you've done that kind of work and because you're both coming up with something some kind of artifact although I was always <laughs> I always felt a bit kind of resentful towards because Louis would basically have his you know, he we'd do some trip. And he's like, well, that's all my Blackpool. Um, I've done all my Blackpool uh, sort of drawings or whatever, or or Portsmouth drawings. Um, and I'm just wait, wait, and and they would be done and dusted more or less while we were there. Whereas, as you know, with writing, you can't just. I wish you could just transcribe your notes, you know, <laughs> and then you'd have it, and everything was all wrapped up nicely, and you had a, a story. It was like. I know I need another couple of weeks to turn this into an actual story, you know, and that, but, but no, he obviously understood that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'd be interested to know if there are any writers that can come up with something pretty polished, you know, on, you know, in the situ. I mean, there, maybe there are, but I'm, I'm not one of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, well, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, there have been people who have experimented with it, but I, you know, not necessarily, Sometimes reading it when it's unedited is a bit, it's like, okay, a bit rough around the edges. Yeah. yeah. Well, photographers, I mean, when I worked with, with Alex, you know, the, the Sebley, the photographer, you know, he, I thought that, you know, again, I learned a lot about, I, or I, I you know, became, you know, became less sort of naive about what someone else's kind of craft involved because, again i felt a bit kind of it was like oh it's easy for you just you know point and click and get your pictures and jobs are good and then i'm the one who has to but then i what i didn't realize was how long a photographer takes after the fact or after the the trip or the event sifting through finding which photos work and you know and that that's a huge that's like their editing process or their mm -hmm. their writing up or the equivalent of you know the time i was locked away in my hotel room trying to write something up from these you know, sort of smudged and occasionally beer stained, you know, notebooks. Um, yeah. Alex would be kind of going through selecting which photos would work and wouldn't for the story or for the book, you know, and stuff. So, yeah. yeah. And now you're, so you, yeah, I, I, um, I know you've mentioned this as well when we were chatting before, but your novel. So, mm. Tell me a bit about that, and, and perhaps one of the one thing it, you know, sort of, um, how how would you relate it to your other writing? I mean, is there something very different? Yeah, I mean, I think it it, it it's focused on the Philippines uh, uh, largely. Um, so over the last couple of trips I've done to the Philippines over the last few years, I've been researching. Um, sort of journalism and non-fiction primarily, but then also trying to, as a sort of side hustle or something or a side project, trying to um, research the, the pre-colonial Philippines. Um, and sort of, and, and that, that's also involved reading a lot of um, sort of, uh, sort of anthropology and history, um, uh, by sort of various um, people who have painstakingly tried to reconstruct what life was before the, the Spanish Empire basically um, sort of um, took over um, the, well, it wasn't the Philippines then, it was just an archipelago of islands and came to be named the Philippines after King Philip of Spain. And um, 
you know, and so, you know, I, I, I was trying to learn about, um, there are still communities in the Philippines that, that are kind of pre-Christian. So the Spanish introduced, you know, Catholicism um, through a, a quite a brutal process of conversion, just as, you know, like they did in Latin America. And that's not, you know, other empires and other European civilizations supposedly behaved the same way in other parts of, of the world, of course. But so I became interested in, you know, just um, so, so yeah, a big part of the book is sort of or one of the narrative strands or non narrative lines is, is sort of set in actually a matriarchal barangay is the word, word for a kind of tribe or community in about 1570 AD, just before the Spanish arrive um, in that part of Luzon Island, which is the main island in the Philippines. But through, this is where it gets weird. And, and I felt like I had to do something. So, so it's, there, there is some continuities with my other work in the sense of the place and the, the, the kind of research and the historical, my interest in the kind of history of, of the Philippines. But it's very different in the sense that it's a very imaginative, almost kind of sort of fan fantasy or science fictional kind of story, because it's about through a sort of process of sympathetic magic, as it were, it's how this matriarchal, the, the sort of fate of this matriarchal tribe in 1570s Philippines is bound up with the fate, but particularly the sort of mental and physical health of a American B-movie actor in the 1980s in, in, in the US who, who travels to the Philippines and makes a film. He, he, he's a kind of, um, he, he's, so I, I was inspired by a colleague of mine called Matt Alford, who's done a lot of research into how the American military has funded and assisted with Hollywood films, but going back really since the beginning of Hollywood. So chances are, you know, um, if it's, uh, if it, you know, think of any sort of Hollywood film of the last 70 or 80 years with a kind of military theme or an act, or not even a military theme, just a lot of action movies, they may have borrowed some helicopters from the Pent or from the US Army, or they may have had their script doctored by the Pentagon. I mean, it sounds like kind of slightly out there conspiracy theory stuff, but my friend and his colleague have done these freedom of information requests and it is all evidenced and they've published it. And it, it was all so that kind of, so this character, Kirk Decker, who's a sort of beaming vector is very much, um, you know, a sort of propagandist for American power. And it's 1986 is, is his sort of time that he's around. So this is kind of Reagan era. Um, and it's also the time of the, of, of the fall of the Marcos, dictatorship in the philippines and that that sort of comes into the story um and so he travels to the philippines to make a film to try and so with marcos's the marcos's aid because the marcos's were very interested in film imelda marcos especially um loved film probably as a kind of propaganda instrument but she built this this sort of very expensive film manila film center you know um, so yeah, it's quite odd, but then it it, it then sort of segues it's sort of something between a historical novel and a strange kind of fantastical novel with um because we then there are subplots about that concern Kirk's relatives and ancestors. So there there's a section that happens that, that takes place in Manila just before World War II breaks out and the Japan because the Japanese invaded more or less. About eight hours after Pearl Harbor, the Japanese swept into the Philippines and took it over very quickly because the U.S. forces and the U.S. troops that were stationed there and the sort of colonial army, that, because the Philippines was a U.S. colony at that time, effectively, was not prepared at all for the Japanese attack, much like they weren't prepared for Pearl Harbor. Um, so his fa this character's father happens to be working in Manila at that point um and then yeah there, there's yeah that's kind of it's pretty weird basically but it's kind of that gives <laughs> yeah, a sense of it anyway, yeah. I hope. <laughs> yeah so uh so what was the um okay what what was the kind of initiating idea then when, when did you kind of think oh hang on this is something i want to write as a novel what, 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 how did that work for you you know 
yeah i i had this idea of uh i think i had this this sort of image of the of these two very different people so like the the queen of a sort of matriarchal tribe where women i mean it's not it's matriarchal where women and there have been some communities like this uh, and there are still today you know not in the majority but where women are, are they're not only sort of respected you know in the way that they are in lots of cultures you know in jewish culture or in african american that like, they actually hold the power and they do the they do the fighting and the hunting and the stuff that in other cultures would be traditionally male um roles right so i just i thought that was interesting this idea of like you know why how and why a matriarchal society could come about when so when most of the other societies have evolved in a different what are the material reasons for that um so that was something that's that you know was been interesting and then i thought well how could you have a character that, that couldn't be more different from that male misogynistic racist you know <laughs> um and then how do they how do they become dependent on each other through some sort of symbolic magical process through time and space so it just I'd, <laughs> just the sort of the the it's that sort of like yeah unity of opposites or something or how two very different things could be connected there was what what really and what i did was i had this vague idea and i would just bore people in pubs about it for about a year and so i've got this idea for a novel but i wasn't actually writing the novel i was just saying oh yeah so there's this sort of action start and they say oh, that's quite weird yeah but that, that, that's, that's something yeah it seems sounds original anyway and then the difficult thing was to crack on and write it and try and make it make sense and it, and that's what i've been doing for five or six years but the, the, the so that was that was the initial idea what what gave me the confidence to actually go ahead and try to make it try to write it was um a brilliant novel which i bought when it came out um but for some reason didn't actually it's just sat in my bookshelf for for years uh, but someone said well you should read cloud atlas um by um david mitchell and i was like okay this is that's how you connect i mean it's much more amb his book is much more ambitious and i'm sure much more successful than mine will be but these different characters in very different times and places are connected through very in, in various very very clever narrative ways and I thought okay it's not going to be as good as that but that's how you might do something like that and and I you know I would just thoroughly recommend that book if people haven't read it because it's just a sort of tour de force of imagination and cleverness and yeah so yeah so, so is it? I mean, is, is your novel structured in a? I don't mean in a similar way to his, but I mean, is it? Is it kind of quite fragmentary, or have you tried to sort of stitch it together into a, a sort of convention, more conventional narrative? Yeah. That so it starts with. I want there to be a kind of a shock when we move from this rather unpleasant sort of. Um, uh, sort of 80s kind of right wing kind of American actor and his world and his very narrow worldview and his abusive relationships with women and other people um, that so that we spend some time with him at the beginning and then and then we move quite suddenly into this um, sort of yeah 500 years before in in and you know several thousand miles away in the Philippines and then from then on there's kind of movement, more rapid movement between the two timelines. But I'm trying to, the, I, I mean, and again, I'm sort of in the editing phase now and I'm, I'm, it's with the editor and I'm, I'm, I'm open to, you know, I, there's a point, there was a point where like, this is the, the in terms of the structure, the structure is really important to a book like this because it relies a lot on surprise. And then people getting it when you do finally say that there's a connection between these two completely different, narrative threads you know it's a it's a different totally different challenge to you know any of the, any kind of other writing i've ever done so i'm very open to if that doesn't work for this person the, the 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 sort of readers reports i think two out of three kind of for the, for the publisher were like yeah we like this it works but then you're kind of left thinking like mm, the third one does that mean i'm gonna i want you know you want you want it to be as 
accessible as possible, don't you? So I'm not taking any chances here. And so I'm open to, but it's a good question. And it is really, structure is really key to this working and this delivering. And there is a decision to be made about how long do you defer that moment of revelation that where the reader goes, ah, okay, now I get it, that these two totally unlike and ideologically, but also, you know, different in so many other ways, characters and set and sort of contexts are actually actually dependent on each other and kind of need to save each other in some strange as i say kind of magical way <laughs> yeah yeah so did you write them you know you say that you know these did you write the two different timelines kind of separately you see what i mean like kind of write one and then or or was it did you find there was something to be had from kind of playing with sort of bouncing off from one to another in in the actual writing but yeah that's another that is another good question i i'm i think the latter moving between the two because i wanted to make sure that there were certain little motifs that were common so that there were clues as to where this is going to go but not to obviously let let the you know let, let it be uh, not to give it away too soon but since you Put it that way, I think there were probably would have been benefits to doing it the other way, actually, to have just almost like written the whole arc of Kirk versus the arc of, of Diane, you know, who's the, and her community is the sort of name of this matriarchal sort of Banangai Capitan, you know, um, sort of queen of the community. So, yeah, I, the, yeah, I could have done it either way, but I think I ended up being more um, like that. And then... I, I, I mean, initially, I thought it was just going to be those two narratives, and I would it would just be you know a sort of two hander in that way. But I felt like I had to justify Kirk's kind of connection. What this is really about is sort of cosmic. I'm giving too much away, but sort of about cosmic justice, and it's it's about and and again, this is where it connects kind of with Cloud Atlas, where his relatives and his ancestors have also have also kind of. They've got an injustice to answer to, you know, and, and it's related to the Philippines and the way they've treated women there and, and behaved in this very colonial and exploitative way. And so I then found myself <laughs> making things even more complicated for myself by going back to like the the, the early 1940s in Manila. And then there's a there's even um, um, a sort of stuff set in the 60s because he has a younger brother who goes to Vietnam um, the fights in Vietnam, but is stationed in Manila uh, for R and R. You know, in those sorts of you know, we've all seen them in kind of seen that that sort of those scenes in you know, kind of Oliver Stone films and the like. Right? You know, um, quite quite crazy um, sort of um, you know, uh, sort of uh, hedonistic sorts of scenes. So yeah, so it became more complicated as I introduced more. Um, and I, the writers group that I'm a part of, and I, I'm sort of showing bits to to the to, to colleagues in the writers group, we're sort of saying like, Tom, you're not making this easy for yourself. <laughs> you know, it seems to be like more and more. And so that's, there had to be some of that trimmed down. I had to, you know, was getting a bit. It was growing into something that might have become a trilogy of novels or something. But um, but hopefully I've kept in enough of that of that that's those sort of subplots so that. So that the kind of main plot makes sense, and you know, it all hinges on that. As I say, that connection between the two, these two characters, these two timelines. Um, so you have to do, you know, I, I, you just have to do as much work as you think is necessary to, so that the reader reads it and and doesn't, and you know, and, and doesn't see the hard work that you've done almost, you know, and just sees, just enjoys it and hopefully gets it the first time and doesn't have to kind of skip back and, you know, is thinking, what the hell happened on page 21? Oh, okay, yeah, that's why this bit makes sense. You don't, you know, ideally you don't want that, do you? So, so. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I asked that question uh, really because I think I've read interviews with writers who've gone both, who've gone both ways. So I don't think there's like a right answer yeah, I think that's probably true of all kind of writing anything sort of full length, isn't it? I don't think there's a there's a right answer. We all have to go about it in our own yeah. way. 
I think some people start with an ending, don't they? They they sort of need a sense of where where this is going to lead to before they can, and then yeah, which I think yeah, I think I've I've probably in some some cases I've I've sort of had a a final insight that I want to try and offer, but then I suppose you the the potential um, sort of shortcoming of that is that you. You know, you you may well. I suppose you I, you might be sort of feel like you're bound to to have to kind of fit that formula. But then, of course, you know everything is always up for change and revision. And you know, um, you know, uh, later drafts are often sort of very radically different to early drafts. And I think that's often sort of the difference between you know a, a writer who really sort of finishes things and, and you know maybe is able to publish things and, and and get somewhere with writing and and the the writer who doesn't is that they've just got this kind of bloody mindedness and this patience and this kind of I'm going to keep at this and if I have to do rewrite the same thing like 20 times then I'm going to do it because I'm going to get it right and it's almost you know it's sort of obsessional behavior which would be you know in other contexts would be you know, might invite sort of allegations that you're not very well. I don't know, you know, that in, <laughs> but, um, you know, but that's kind of what you, or, may, or maybe, or maybe I'm just doing it wrong. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. No, no, no. It all sounds completely <laughs> rather uh, familiar. And, and also from other writers that I talked to said the same thing, you know, that one of the key important skills is almost this kind of obsessional persistence of you know keeping going and but also being able to recognize no that's not right yet and yeah. even if it takes 20 25 attempts um, yeah that, i think listening listening to people you know to get, get getting the opinions of others is really important like we're not nobody gets this right by themselves the first time or even the second time or the third time or the, you know, the fourth draft of the draft. And I think that's really helped me. You know, you need people who are going to be honest with you. I think it's not much use showing your stuff to friends who are kind of maybe not going to tell you the truth because they don't want to upset you or seem rude or impertinent. So you need like a, someone who will be, you know, hard, you know, astringent and harsh if they have to be, but, you know, um, you know, and may, maybe, uh, yeah, I think you, you sort of have to, and you also have to stop being kind of precious about things and accept that you you may have spent a long, long time not not getting it right. Or, and there might be just very, you know, the, the input and the output do not really match up in terms of the hours you put in. I think, I think someone like, um, uh, was it um, A.S. Byatt, I think, sort of said, she said something like, um, it's just ludicrous, like the amount of time you put in. If you put that much time into learning how to cook, or you know, you'd 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 get some, you know, a, quite a lot of tasty food at the end of it, and you might even get to become a kind of chef or something. Yeah. But the amount of time you you put into writing, and then the output that you get, which is you know a book or an article, there's just no. It, it's it's a it's a very sort of um labor labor intensive and not not very rewarding in that way. So. So yeah, you have to be patient and you have to accept that it's not, you know, you won't always be rewarded. I mean, sometimes it goes easy and I'm I'm surprised, you know, especially a shorter form thing when I'm like an article where I just think, well, I kind of know what I want to say. And I've rehearsed this enough. I've bought again, bored my friends down the pub with this kind of opinion of mine. And so that comes out and it's like, oh, okay, I spent a couple of hours on that and, and it's I'm quite happy with it. But for the most part, it's a lot of just kind of, you know, beating your head against a brick wall, really, and then. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting what you say about other people. I think that's very important. And, you know, I remember uh, I've written this novel, which hasn't been published, because I realise it's just a bit of a no hopery now. But I wrote it in a writing group, and I had the same experience, and was reading bits, and people going, oh, this is just hilariously funny, and, you know, brilliant. Ah, yeah. you know, blah, blah, blah. And then I showed it to another mate, who's also a writer, and he just said, yeah, it's okay, Tom, but uh, the, your big problem is that your main character is just really unlikable. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, right. and I thought, oh, that, I thought, 
I didn't really think about it. And then I realized, oh my God, that's me. You know, <laughs> that, that's part, or at least it's part of me. Yeah. And, you know, I, so this character is thinking or saying things which are yeah. you know, not the, you know, not the best possible Tom, I'll put it that way. <laughs> Uh, well, I, you know, be, being the charming, decent fellow you are, I find that hard to believe. But even be that as it may, I'm a big fan of unlikable characters. I mean, I don't really buy this thing that you sort of have to have. I don't know. It feels like a bit of a kind of, um, I don't know, it's a bit of a sort of film critics cliche, isn't it? It's like, I just didn't care about the characters. You know, it's like, well, yeah. you can care about a character. But I mean, my, you know, this my protagonist really is is deliberately, grotesquely awful. I mean, I, I found myself... I've got dictionaries of American slang going back to the sort of to the 30s and stuff because I'm deliberately looking for really unpleasant insults that people would have thrown at each other, you know, at that time, you know, and, and I want it to be historically accurate and I want it, you know, and, and so there's, yeah, I don't know. I mean, each to their own, I suppose, but um, yeah, I think... Um, I think I think as long as there's as long as the sort of character changes and it, as long as it's interesting, right? As long as it's as long as there's some kind of like momentum to the story, that, that that's all I care about, really. I think, but then I think, you know. And just uh, one, one, yeah, actually, you know, um, one thing I, I guess people may well be interested in is, is it's sort of well, it's the how did he go about getting it published? Yeah. Um, so. Um, for me, this was, this was, well, it's always difficult. You know, I feel like I, I you know, even though I've, I've sort of had some success with, with publishing, it always feels like you're, you're starting all over again, you know, and, and, um, you know, the, like the contacts that you make, um, again, it seems like it, it's not, I don't know, people people leave their posts at publishers or people move on and the world changes very quickly. The sort of publishing world changes very quickly. You know, so um and but but for me, fiction was a was a new field, you know, a whole new kind of field. I I might have had some kind of a network beginning to emerge in terms of, you know, sort of journalism and publishing non-fiction books. I mean, for example, um Coast of Teeth was um, was published by the by Signal, who did uh, my Realm of the Punisher, which was my, my sort of travelogue of the Philippines. Mm -hmm. So you know, there was something there about you know I'd done enough of a reasonable job for um, them to trust me to to have another go, and that was nice. But with fiction, I felt like I was start well, I was starting really from from sort of square one, and so I. Did the usual thing i got the writers and artists yearbook and i looked for agents first of all um it was kind of tantalizing because there was one agent that got back to me um well it's interesting actually because there was there was one agent got back to me and and this may be a sign of the times i don't know and it was really code for don't think it's really appropriate for a, a white bloke well i'm sort of technically jewish on my mother's side but effectively white you know um to be writing about, you know, the Philippines and women in the Philippines, especially in colonialism and things like that. That was the sort of coded, they said, well, while we respect your kind of scholarly background in the Philippines and your knowledge of the Philippines, kind of don't, you know, you you, you shouldn't be doing it. So I was okay, and I kind of, all right, well, I'll just, you know, that's a dead end. Um, but then there was another agent who, sort of said this is very interesting but it's not quite you know it's a it, i'm going to call this a near miss and that feels like so near and yet so far doesn't it? it's like it's almost like well, it gave me hope to carry on and then i tried a bunch of publishers in right last year but didn't get anywhere um and then i found someone um recommended uh i don't know if you uh, you Tom, you, I'm sure you'll you'll know this magazine called Ms. Lexia. It's um mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. A quite well established magazine, um, which uh, I think the Ms. Lexia is a sort of is a pun because it's for women writers of fiction mostly, but you know, and it's quite well established. They publish 
um, a really, really good book that I couldn't recommend more, which is the the, the Mislexia Guide to Small or the or the sort of indie press, the independent press. And so I I got a lot more. Um, the, you know, these are smaller operations than you would find, you know, in the Writers and Artists Yearbook. But it was basically a whole different kind of roster of publishers. And that's where I had, yeah, I had sort of offers from two two different publishers. One seemed quite, um, I mean, w w one seemed very sort of um, very small and, and perhaps may not have done, you know, didn't seem like it was going to do the necessary publicising of the book. And so I I said, thanks, but but no thanks kind of thing. But Cosmic Egg is is what, and, the, and they're a subsidiary of John Hunt Publishing, which um, also, you know, I was encouraged by that because they are also the kind of, um, one of their other subsidiaries is uh, Zero Books, which is a really good, uh, I'm a huge fan of their, they tend to do sort of political and cultural studies type books. So Mark Fisher, the oh, right, yeah. all his books are on Zero and, you know, and so I thought, okay, and a, and a colleague of mine, um, you know, who, 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 whose work I very much respect, published with them. And and when I said to him, like, it's a bit weird, like going on a website and sort of uploading your thing, and then you see the readers' reports come through the website. And he said, "Oh no, that's just how it is now, Tom. You know, it's just like that's the that you know I had to do it that way." And and so okay, that's fine. And had a had a you know got got an offer um, with. Um, you know, I think they're going to print sort of a couple of thousand initially, which is all right. Um, no, no advance, um, but sort of better royalties for that, um, you know, for it and stuff. I, I'm a member of the Society of Authors who, um, I, I don't know whether there's an equivalent in your part of the world now or whether, you know, but I, but I, they were very good. They looked at the contract and, and sort of, made some suggestions about i think it was generally kosher but made some suggestions about what what should be improved and things so yeah i just did what any one else would do you know despite trying to call in some favors and trying to get in touch with people you know i had a friend of mine who i grew up with who worked in you know publishing for years and years and years but she had just quit she just be, sort of be, you know left that business i was like damn i've lost that opportunity so yeah. to say things change and, and 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 the landscape shifts quite rapidly so you so yeah you can often find yourself kind of um i mean i mean that's evidenced even by how um you know i noticed it wasn't ms lexia was generally very up to date but the writers and artists yearbook one finds that actually email addresses and phone numbers and uh, you know go out of date quite quickly because i suppose people just you know businesses you know change or go under or people move and move between roles and stuff so, yeah. yeah yeah which makes it difficult because you know we have to try and mm, steer our way through this terrain you know so but it does change so, yeah anyway tom thanks thanks for, i don't know do anyone here have any questions no okay there you go um <laughs> sure <laughs> yeah thank you very much uh a pleasure to talk to you as always and um thank you tom for inviting me no i mean yeah, i really enjoyed it and, stuff and, and yeah. I the, how long how long till it's published do you know have you got a schedule or are you still um yeah i think we're looking at probably um sort of uh be sort of like autumn or winter 2020 next year so yeah yeah they want to okay. which is sort of quite fast i think um yeah relatively so yeah I'm, I'm down with that i'm just waiting for the editor to get back to me and prepared to just try and do a bit you know if i have to do some restructuring and rethinking of that you know that kind of that key sort of pivotal moment then then so be it but yeah all right well i hope it goes well mate and um, thank yeah. you Excellent. Right. Thanks a lot. And um, yeah, speak soon. Definitely. Yeah. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Hope that was of interest to you. Good luck with your own writings and projects and anything else. Thanks a lot, mate. Cheers. Cheers. Bye bye. Yeah.